So we're continuing to explore uh, our series of, on Christian identity. When you become a Christian, you become one of the most blessed people in the whole of the world. That's what the Bible uh, says about you. And I'm reading through the Bible uh, in one year, as I try and do every year. Well, I manage to do every year, mostly. This uh, week I've arrived at Ephesians 1 verse 3, and that says that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I'll read that again. God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That's very blessed, isn't it? There's quite a lot of blessing there. You are blessed. And if you are a Christian, you are one of the most blessed people in the world. The Bible tells me I have an identity, which is the strongest part of my identity, and that is in Christ Jesus. And so far we've looked at the themes, I am made in the image of God, and we've looked at I am a child of God. And those sermons are on YouTube, you can link through the website uh, to watch those, and please do that and be encouraged by them. We're made in the image of God, you are special, God does love you, you're designed, made to a template made to communicate with him on a spiritual plane. You're made for a relationship uh, with him. All humanity is. And then you are a child of God. When you became a Christian, when you accepted Jesus into your life by faith, you were adopted into the family of God as he forgave you your sins, as you repented of those. You are an heir to a spiritual promise. You know God in your heart, and you know his perfect love for his children. And I was looking on the internet about what people say about identity. And as I've I've written in the the article on the front of your newsletter this month, uh, I came across psychologytoday.com. And uh, so they said this. Uh, I quoted that in in the article. They said, identity encompasses the memories, experiences, relationships and values that create one's sense of self. And that new facets are developed and incorporated into one's identity over time. It's interesting, isn't it? What do we make of that, I wonder? How do we, how do we sort of critically engage with that? Our, um, our identity is both who we are today and our lives so far, and also who we choose to become. You know, thinking about the past can be, can be good news or can be bad news. I bet it's mixed for all of us. Perhaps you had a happy upbringing. Perhaps your upbringing was difficult. Perhaps you had a happy time at school. Perhaps school's difficult for you. Perhaps life's been good. On the whole, perhaps life's been really tough. Perhaps you were a part of a, a you know, great church growing up. You had a lot of people to support you. Perhaps you lacked that support. I hope that you find that here in Penrath uh, now and today. As I said... Uh, such a lovely bunch of people here. I've experienced so much love and acceptance and kindness uh, here from people. I just want to bless you for that and thank you. But I acknowledge that for in, in the past, as we reflect on the past, there, there might be pain uh, for you there. But the Bible has some amazing news for us. Can we have our um, Bible reading? That's 2, two Corinthians. Um, hopefully in on a different slide there. 2 Corinthians, we're going to read just verses, uh, uh, chapter 5, verses 14 through to 17. For Christ's love compels us, writes Paul, as he reflects on all his ministry and all he's doing, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. The Bible says that 
Identity formed from your past is not the dominant part of your identity. It challenges that. You are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Let's explore. I was recently doing a, a bit of video editing on, uh, I, on Movie Maker. Oh, sorry, iMovie it was. I'd done this talk um, and ready for a little presentation that I was sending a video to for NWBA. And, and it was okay, but there was this just hideous stutter halfway through. And I thought, I really don't want to record that whole thing again. The rest of it's okay. Um, I'll clip it. So, uh, uh, so I did. I, I, I zoomed in on the clip and took out that horrendous little stutter. And, and there it was. I sent it off. Wonderful facility. Saved us a lot, saves a lot of time. Uh, a bit of uh, video editing. And wouldn't it be great if life was like that? Wouldn't it be great? You know, if you could just scroll back, select, click and drag, bang, delete. It's gone. Wouldn't life be great? Wow. And the Bible says that if we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus and trust in him, trust in his death for us on the cross, we are forgiven and God has erased that as he looks at us. In the eyes of God, we are forgiven. That's an incredible thing to claim. Um, but the Bible does, does put it quite this frankly. Let's have a look at some scriptures, if we can have our presentation back. Uh, one is Jeremiah 31, where uh, it's written, I will forgive their wickedness. So the Bible says as if, if you have wickedness in your previous character, and if you look in other parts of Corinthians, Paul says, that is what some of you were, as he lists off a whole list of things that, that, that you wouldn't want to be identified with. Um, Paul, if you had that in your past... Um, We read in Jeremiah, I will forgive their wickedness. Which is pretty amazing. But And then, how about the individual sins? Each one of the individual sins that you have have committed, it says, are actually forgiven. Not just the general kind of thing, but the individual sins themselves. No longer counted against you. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then it goes beyond this. Both of those verses extend beyond this because if we we look a bit further in Jeremiah, we find that it says, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I won't even remember their sins, says God. I don't think that's because God's forgetful. I think it's because he chooses not to remember them. And then, in the eyes of God, he doesn't count those things as he looks at us. He doesn't count those things in in our identity. And then in 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansed. No longer carrying the dirt. No longer carrying that, that, that. appearance in the sight of God that would mar us, we are cleansed in the sight of God. And I'm not going to pretend that life is like that completely as we continue to work out our lives in this earth. Obviously, the consequences of our sins do do continue with us. It's not like the rest of the people on earth uh, remember our sins no more. We still carry that. We still need to deal with that in humility and in penitence with God's help. But the Bible tells us that as God sees us, as he engages with us, as he loves us, as he, as he makes plans for us, as he thinks about our future, our past does not reckon in it. God has perfected us in his death on the cross through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's placed our sins, we read in the Psalms, as far far from us as the east is from the west. Doesn't even remember them. Cleanses us from our unrighteousness. So, wonderful. Then, 
Uh, we are given a tool that we can deal with this in, in this passage. Did you see that it said uh, that one died for all and therefore all died? Now elsewhere, uh, Paul expands this a bit more where he says in Romans 6, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, and elsewhere it says we've been buried with Christ and raised with him t- to new life. It's like the sin in us has died. It's actually died. And we've been brought back uh, to, to life. What does it mean to be a dead to sin? Well, it means, yes, I'm tempted, but I decide that's not going to, I'm not going to respond um, because I'm dead to that. It, it, I know that sin brings misery, it brings harm, it brings, it, it brings evil. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be amused by it. I'm, I'm not going to uh, en- entertain the thought of it. I'm not going to focus on it. I am going to be dead to sin. And I have died to sin. So both something that has happened as I've become a Christian and something that I continue to choose. And as I do that, as I move forwards, the Bible says that I flourish. The old has gone. I've died to sin. The new is here. Verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. They are a new creation, is the other translation. The old has gone, the new is here. What does it mean to be a new creation? Can we really claim that we are this new creation? And Colossians 3 verse 1, where Paul also is exploring this, it says, you've been raised with Christ. You have uh, become a new being, a new spiritual being. When you, when, you, when you became a Christian, your life is spiritually connected to the death and new life of Jesus. Your sin was placed upon him. He bore it on the cross. And then when Jesus rose, your soul was raised with him. You have that eternal life already, And the essence and the beginning of that life is yours today and into eternity. So back to that analogy of of, um, the the, uh, iMovie where I I can just, you know, cut that bit out. It's not only that. God God takes the, the real you. He weaves a new and beautiful story with you as a new creation. He rips up the script that is defined by the past and gives you a future based on a renewed identity in him. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And it's, and it's a, a story with an amazing ending, which is not actually an ending at all. It's a new beginning in eternity in heaven. God wants to bless He wants you to grow, develop, and flourish. Romans 6 verse 4. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We can live a new life in God. And then verse 12 of that uh, same chapter of Romans 6. You are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3 verse 5. You have been raised with Christ. You're raised. You can live a new life. The old has gone. The new is here. And God gives us the power of his Holy Spirit. Power to transform us. Power to give us peace. Power to change our hearts. But also power to live the Christian life. It's not easy, is it? Living the Christian life. But we need, and we need that power. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. So psycho- psychology today is not the whole story. The, the, our past is there, but we're defined by God's image in us. Beautifully created, restored, redeemed, and renewed. And the discovery of Jesus doesn't just get incorporated into our identity. It doesn't just become a facet of our identity. It transforms our identity and remolds our identity. We 
become the Jesus-shaped you. Karl Martin writes about this in his book, where he talks about there being a Jesus-shaped version of us that we can discover, that we can live in. We can be uh, the presence of Jesus. His love, joy, his peace, his patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We can be and work out his Holy Spirit in our lives. And maybe you're thinking, what if it doesn't work for me? And Nicky Gumbel writes this. Uh, he wrote this. What difference has Jesus made? He asks. The genuine answers given by people, uh, he, he, he quotes, are these. My life has completely changed. I now look at the world through different eyes. I feel love for everyone and an inner peace that I never imagined could exist. Someone else writes, I had been living my life in a dark hole. I was carrying a weight on my shoulders, a great weight on my shoulders. That burden has gone. I am filled with great hope, joy, excitement and love. And all I want to do is to serve Christ in whatever form he chooses. So, and then a third one. I feel like I have found love and conquered death in one day. The difference Jesus makes, Nicky Gumbel concludes, is massive, eternal, and impossible to fully comprehend. And maybe you're a Christian, but you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to take this too far. It all sounds a bit too extreme. Maybe if I become too Christian, then I'll lose my identity because it won't really be me anymore. I should hold on to a few sort of bad bits because that's kind of me. Bible screams no. Bible screams no. Um, call out the sin uh, in, in your life, in your heart. God made you and designed you in perfection and beauty. That is the real you. That is the true you. That is the true you that, that is wanting to come out, that is wanting to push through You will, be more, uh, you will be a more real version of you than you could ever be if you fully trust in Jesus and allow God to transform you into that Jesus-shaped you, writes Carl Martin. So we place ourselves once again into God's hands. We come to him repenting of our sins, trusting in his manifold mercy, trusting that he knows our hearts, that he loves us, and relying on his Holy Spirit Relying on his Holy Spirit to change us, to transform us, to step out into his love and beauty, his plans for our lives as they unfold, to bring transformation to the people around us by the power of his Holy Spirit, not in our strength, but in the power of his Holy Spirit as he inspires us, as he equips us, as he leads us, as he guides us. And let me finish with Romans uh, 15 verse uh, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.